Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, as I have heard earlier, uh, as we were gathering, uh, top of the morning to everyone here on a uh, beautiful, sunny, uh, glorious St. Patrick's Day. Uh, very pleased to have everyone joining us indoors today. Uh, certainly, we will expedite things so that you can get out and enjoy uh, today. Uh, with that, I'm going to call to order the meeting, uh, the monthly meeting of the Health Committee for the County of Renfrew uh, and ask first, has the roll been called? Yes, it has. Thank you, Ms. Shapu. Uh, I would then invite any disclosure of pecuniary interest and if any, the general nature thereof. The chair recognizes none. Uh, can I have a motion please on the minutes of our previous meeting held on February 10th, 2021. Uh, moved by Councillor Dufresnier, seconded by Councillor Bennett. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor. That is carried, thank you. Uh, with that, very pleased this morning, uh, uh, this will be the, my uh, second opportunity to review this. I uh, want to invite um, uh, Ms. Sheedy, uh, Director of Long-Term Care, and Jennifer White, the Director of Care for Miramichi Lodge, uh, to make a presentation on the uh, outbreak update. Uh, so with that then, uh, Ms. Sheedy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair Donahue. Good morning to you and all members of Health Committee. Very pleased to have Jennifer White uh, with me this morning. Um, uh, our goal today is to give you an update on the outbreak at Miramichi Lodge. And I think you will be uh, particularly interested in Jennifer's portion of the presentation as I think you will see all of the planning uh, and great work that has gone in uh, to the COVID care unit at Miramichi Lodge. And in fact, uh, Chair Donahue had asked uh, Jennifer uh, to repeat this part of the presentation. Uh, so with that, uh, Sean has a PowerPoint presentation, so he's going to share his screen and we'll get started. So uh, if you just flip to the next screen, uh, Sean, I will start with the background. Um, so let me just preface by saying that, um, you know, although we had hoped and prayed we would not end up in an outbreak situation at either of our homes, I do believe that we took every precaution that we could have. And um, a lot of that thanks goes to this committee uh, particularly the chair and the warden who through our EOC meetings and our Friday evening emails and Saturday afternoon emails as we ran into challenges throughout this pandemic, the incredible support we've had from both health committee and county council uh, to make what I am calling a very, taking a very precautionary approach. And often the measures that we took were a couple of steps ahead of the province making them mandatory. Uh, so I'll just review a few of them with you. Um, early on in the pandemic, after the pandemic was declared as Chair uh, Denny, who has reminded us was a year ago today, um, the provincial chief officer of health had often indicated in his um, guidance documents to us that uh, staff working in more than one for more than one healthcare organization was a huge risk. And there was always recommendations, recommendations, but no directives. Uh, so I took that uh, to particularly the chair and the warden and the CAO, and there was complete support that the County of Renfrew long-term care homes would move to a sole employer, employer requirement uh, long before it was mandatory. And I want to highlight that like the province or unlike rather the province, it wasn't limited to just other healthcare organizations. It was any employer. So if you remember early on in the pandemic, people working in grocery stores had no protection. There was no PPE, there was no plexiglass, there was no, you know, the one way aisles. Um, so, you know, some of our staff work in other types of part-time jobs that are not healthcare related that could in fact be higher risk. Um, so we made that decision uh, early on in March. We also, as we got into the uh, pandemic and did experience some positive staff cases um, and were 
preparing uh, for that dreaded day of having a positive resident case, we knew that we wouldn't have enough room in our homes to properly isolate residents. And again, you've heard this from me time and again, uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, the uh, symptoms of COVID are very broad and very vague. And so almost anything other than normal is a symptom of COVID. And so we always, almost always have residents that are what are called suspect. And that means that uh, they are isolated or quarantined to their room. Um, but if they don't have a private room, then we have to think about the roommate. And so again, with your support, we closed to community admissions through uh, the spring into the early summer to create that physical capacity so that we um, had some empty beds that we could maintain. So that if we had a suspect case, we could move the resident into an empty room until that result came back. And you know, up until February 21st, every time those results came back negative, but we were able to reduce that risk, that potential risk. Um, at some point, I'm going to guess it was um, early, around late summer, early fall, uh, there was a recommendation uh, that staff wear eye protection, whether they're safety glasses or sh face shields. Um, that, to this day, that is not mandatory provincial wide in long term care. We made it mandatory in both of our homes uh, for our staff. And if an essential caregiver was actually providing care to a resident, then they wear it as well. Um, as you know, the staff are tested regularly. The frequency depends on the status of our health unit region. Uh, so whether we're in lockdown, red, green, or as we currently are in orange. As you know, we have transitioned to rapid an antigen testing, uh, starting with our staff on February 22nd and our uh, essential caregivers just this Monday. However, we have chosen to test everybody who comes into our home at every visit. That is higher than the provincial standard. Next slide, please. Again, early on in the pandemic, the uh, province required that any visitors to long-term care, whether they were essential caregivers or regular visitors, had to attest to a negative COVID uh, result within the last two weeks of the visit prior to. Uh, we required proof of. And the value in that was seen that when we did require proof of, all of a sudden there was a challenge in getting those results. Um, we also, um, our um, managers had sourced an app, a screening app. So it's an added layer to our screening process that reduces the chance of human error. Uh, so the ministry requirement is that we have an active screening process. So in addition to that, uh, anybody that comes to our home, uh, again, staff or essential caregivers, uh, completes um, the questionnaire, the same screening tool uh, that the province has given us on an app. And then when they come into the home, the screener verifies that that was completed and that they did pass the screening. They do a temperature check, which further uh, confirms their ability to proceed on to either work or visit with a resident. And now again, we've added uh, rapid antigen testing. Um, so for our visitors, uh, they wait the 15 minutes until those results are back as negative before they are cleared to advance to visit the resident. Um, the health unit did two audits uh, on uh, infection prevention and control measures throughout the pandemic, one early on, one sort of summertime. Uh, when the outbreak was declared at Miramichi Lodge, we asked them to come in and do another one. Uh, there were no red flags identified, but just to give everybody peace of mind. And then um, we also, we are now working, um, we'll touch on this in a minute, but we have daily meetings with a number of groups. And one of them is the Lynn and the Ontario Health IPAC team. And we also asked them to come in and do an audit. And that happened last Thursday. And again, no red flags were identified. Next screen, please. 
So in terms of the chronology of event events, I'm going to refer to the residents as cases, to everyone as cases. That's in no way disrespectful uh, to these people, uh, but that's how the um, health unit refers to them. And now that we have a positive staff case, uh, we can't just say resident number one uh, because they do, uh, they do have to be tracked in chronological order. So on February the 20th, we were informed by the health unit that one of our residents had a close contact with um, a person and uh, that resident lived on 3A. And so we immediately isolated that resident to their room and that resident was tested. And then on February the 22nd, late on Sunday evening, we got a con call from the health unit to confirm that that person was in fact COVID positive. And so that triggered uh, Jennifer to stand up the COVID care unit. And um, if Sean can advance to the next slide, Jennifer will take you through our COVID care unit. Hi, thanks Shelley. Um, hi everybody. Uh, so we wanted to take this opportunity to put your mind at ease by walking you through both the setup and staffing of our COVID care unit. Uh, the setup of the COVID care unit was, as Shelley mentioned, part of our preparedness planning that began uh, close to almost exactly a year ago now when COVID-19 was first emerging as a pathogen of concern. Um, essentially, the goal of the COVID care unit is to mitigate risk by having a dedicated space to cohort and care for residents um, who might be COVID positive that it was completely separate from other non-affected residents. We also plan to ensure that our staff um, who were caring for positive COVID cases were also not caring for well residents. Uh, so we called this team our COVID response team, and uh, we have over 20 staff who have volunteered to be on the front lines caring for our positive COVID cases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so many of you, I believe, are familiar with our, our facility in, in normal times. Uh, you know, we did have events and, and other uh, exciting things happening. Um, but here is the front of Miramichi Lodge. You can see here on the right is our main entrance to the home. And this is where all of the traffic goes through um, the screener. And so it is a very controlled um, entry to the home. And there isn't anybody that comes through those doors that doesn't um, get passed uh, through screening. Over on the left, uh, you can see kind of a glassed area. So that's a, a stairway up to the second floor. Um, and around that corner, if we can advance to the next slide is a separate entrance, uh, which we have de dedicated to our COVID response team. This is an additional precaution uh, so that the COVID response team is not going, you know, traveling through any common areas or entering at the same point as uh, other staff. Uh, so this is just right through those doors. You can see that it's very clearly uh, marked off uh, and this is a restricted area with access to the COVID care team uh, only. I don't think I can say enough how fortunate we are to have the layout and design that we do of Miramichi Lodge in one of the meetings with our families, Dr. Cushman, who had worked for a number of years with the Lynn, uh, actually said we're within the, the top five uh, that he's seen. So right at the top of the stairs, we had uh, washrooms for both men and women that can be dedicated as dedicated washrooms and change rooms for our COVID response team. This is just a depiction um, so that, that there's an appreciation of how isolated. So this is an area of our home where there really is no reason for any other traffic. Uh, the setup of the COVID care unit is not disruptive. So on the right-hand side, you can see that's the front of the building. Um, so that's just out to the, to the front porch. And then on the left-hand side, all of those doors are access to um, what is our community center and chapel. Um, and we are so fortunate to have, uh, you know, such a, such a spacious area as well as some um, benefits in terms of air exchange and air, air filtration in that area of the home. So this is the first section. So uh, at this point, uh, this area was empty. We do have 
uh, beds in here now. So one of the benefits that we have were built in partitions. So this is the front part of our community center. Um, we're going to go through the other partitions, but basically we have it uh, divided into three sections. So there's this side, the middle is kind of an anteroom for the COVID care team. And then in the chapel, uh, we do have beds. We had started off with the majority of our beds uh, in the chapel. Uh, and just as of recently, um, we have used it as a dedicated space for palliation. Next slide, please. So this is the second section. So you can see here on the left, this is the partition uh, facing the area where uh, we were just looking at. Um, in this area, we have ample supplies so that the COVID care team uh, has everything that they might need in order to care for the residents. They're not having to call or run around for anything. They have a dedicated uh, break area and if we can advance to the next slide. I can show you uh, the nursing unit that they have set up. So you can see um, they really do have everything that they need. This is something, you know, while we, um, while we never wanted to activate it, it is something that we have been planning and been prepared for uh, since, since the onset. So they have a dedicated medication cart. They've got uh, computers, access to internet, um, telephone lines, all, all of those things. So uh, they really are a, a self-sufficient unit at this point. I, I did want to mention as well, just in terms of staffing, um, that there are also considerable efforts made to cohort staff outside of the COVID team. So the majority of our staff are assigned to one home area in their master schedules. Uh, when staffing challenges arise, such as a sick call, we do strive to replace staff from the same unit, uh, then the same floor. Uh, there are times when that is not possible, uh, but even in these cases, our infection prevention and control precautions that Shelley described early on with the universal masking, uh, universal eye protection uh, are sufficient to, to, to mitigate uh, risks, so very low risk, even if we do have to, have to borrow from another unit. Next slide. Uh, we thought this was quite an industrious <laughs> from the onset. So one of the challenges when, when setting up our COVID care unit um, this time last year was that uh, from the chapel perspective, there wasn't a place to actually wash your hands. We had a lot of alcohol-based hand rub. Uh, so some of us are familiar from seeing these at the fairs. Uh, it is a, a portable water station and it does enable staff to be able to wash their, their hands uh, right at point of care. Next slide, please. So this is an example of our uh, COVID care unit. So you can see that uh, at this time we had had three active cases. And so you can see that each case is more than adequately physically distanced. Uh, we are using uh, physical barriers that are wipeable. Uh, we have whiteboards at each station so that we're recording vital signs. Every resident is monitored, monitored quite uh, closely. And we have done um, a lot of efforts to make sure that while they are staying on the COVID unit, that it is a comfortable stay as it can be. So they, we do try and include as many amenities, uh, individual activities for people to do. Um, we do have TV set up with uh, Netflix and, and movies and, and other things to help uh, pass the time. And this is just a view from, from the other end. Uh, you can see um, the table here is where there is a uh, kind of a drop-off station. So when the meals and other items are brought, uh, they deliver it there, ring a bell, and then leave. And then the other staff will come out and, and collect uh, collect the, the food or supplies. So uh, it really is an efficient uh, setup. And when we did have the health unit as well as the uh, regional IPAC team, we did get a lot of compliments on um, how expertly this unit was set up. So uh, like I said, while we were hoping not to use it, we are, we are proud that, uh, that we were able to and um, grateful that we have the space and uh, resources to do so. So thank you. Thanks, Jen, and uh, kudos to Jennifer and uh, the Miramichi Lodge team, as she indicated, that was a year in the planning. Uh, hope to never have to use it, um, but it is very effective. Uh, so continuing on with the chronology of events for this outbreak, um, as you know, unfortunately, we lost our uh, first resident. 
um, residents number two and three uh, did resolve. So they are back on their home unit. And more recently, we have also lost resident number four. Um, as of uh, this morning, resident number five uh, was actually resolved yesterday and that person will be returning to their unit today. And we have a resident number six and number eight uh, who are symptomatic and so they are isolating in this CCU that Jennifer just overviewed. And then uh, case number seven is a staff person who thankfully has mild symptoms, uh, is self-isolating at home and was contact traced to uh, confirm had no high-risk contact within our home, whether that be residents or other staff. All of the positive cases received at least the first dose of their vaccination. Some weren't able to get the second dose right at this time because they had active symptoms. Next slide. I just wanted to touch on the variants as well. Next slide, please, Sean. like maybe we have a bit of a technical difficulty, but I will just um, reassure you uh, that the health unit has confirmed that anytime there is a positive COVID result, uh, that swab is further tested for any variants. It does take quite a bit of time, uh, upwards of five days to get those results. Um, but to date, no variants have been detected in any of the Miramichi Lodge swabs. And in fact, any swabs in Renfrew County. Um, just a bit, or a bit of other information. Um, so at this time, uh, all of the residents that uh, are actively positive, including our index case, um, come from one unit and that is 3A. So those uh, residents continue to be quarantined on their unit and we are testing them every three days. Um, we do test the residents in the rest of the facility on a regular basis as well. That's dependent upon uh, the health unit guidance. Um, and we do test our staff once a week at a minimum as well. Um, throughout the outbreak, you know, as we've talked about these suspect uh, cases earlier, um, we have and do continue to have residents that have symptoms. Again, symptoms are very broad. Um, and uh, there's careful monitoring about whether those symptoms are lingering side effects of the vaccine or uh, suspect COVID, but nonetheless, they are tested and they are uh, quarantined to their room until that result comes back. All the residents on 2B, uh, those were those two initial cases that were cleared. Um, those residents were uh, initially uh, isolated as well and they were cleared on March the 12th. Um, the last time we tested all the residents on the other unit was March 15th and as well as all of the staff. Uh, we have a daily outbreak meeting uh, with all of the management team at Miramichi Lodge, the Rampart County and District Health Unit, the Ministry of Long-Term Care, the Lynn and Ontario Health to review uh, the status of all of the residents and any staff and uh, talk about next steps. And then as I indicated earlier, um, we did request most recently an audit uh, by the Lynn IPAC team with no red flags identified. Uh, the next slide uh, is the uh, summary of our vaccinations to date. Um, so uh, again, I'm gonna give thanks and appreciation to Jennifer White and her team. Um, these are some of the highest results in the province. So our residents at this point Point, uh, there's only one resident that has ha, is unable to be vaccinated at this time. Uh, although I do want to caution you, the percentages are a bit of a moving target. There is snapshot on that particular day. Um, and for some residents, uh, they only have had their first dose because they were recently admitted um, or changed their mind. They didn't get their first dose when the other residents did, uh, but the majority of them are second doses. 
uh, for the staff, uh, we're at 82%, but there's a number that have appointments uh, to have their dose. Um, some of them had a small group, uh, the COVID care team uh, had their first dose at the same time the residents did. So they've already had their second dose. Majority have only had their first dose, but again, a very high uptake of 82%. Just as a bit of a comparison, uh, the last I've read from the province, uh, the long-term care average is about 67%. And I do anticipate Miramichi Lodge will come close to 90% with those that are scheduled. Our essential caregivers are at 98%. Again, that's fantastic. Uh, you're always gonna have a number of people who uh, have been recommended not to take it at this point. Um, so the vaccinations remain ongoing for all three groups. Again, um, you know, we may have staff coming back from a leave, a new staff person being hired. We may have an essential caregiver that changes their mind and decides to take it. Um, and as Jennifer um, has uh, indicated, uh, the health unit and the Pembroke Regional Hospital has been incredibly accommodating uh, to any of our three groups to make sure that anybody who can be vaccinated is vaccinated. Um, so we have no concern of vaccine hesitancy at Miramichi Lodge and hope that this is a good um, a good indicator for other homes. And then as you all know, um, the province has decided that the second dose of vaccine for anyone other than residents of a long-term care home or a retirement home, they will get their second dose and, and have in our case in Mercury County, in the long-term care homes, they've all had their second doses. Um, but for anyone else, such as staff and essential care caregivers, they may be postponed to up to 16 weeks uh, so that more, uh, more groups in the province can get their first dose. Next slide, please. So at this point in time, we have two positive residents in the COVID care unit. The residents on 3A remain quarantined. We have one positive result among staff. We can continue, can expect to continue to have ongoing suspect cases. And I'm sorry, you can ignore those asterisks. That's a typo on my, uh, my part. Um, surveillance testing uh, is only PCR at this point. Um, when you go into outbreak, we do not use rapid testing. So that is on hold until the outbreak is declared over. And we do thank everybody for continuing to follow the public health protocols. I wanted to touch on uh, the ongoing communications that we've had with our three major stakeholder groups being residents, staff and families. So in the next slide, I've just indicated, um, we have a regular email uh, chain going with all of our families. Uh, we print those out in hard copy for our residents. And so that just gives you an indication of how often they happen. Um, prior to the outbreak, it was about once a week. So you can see that it's almost, if not every day, every second day, but as there is news or information to share. We've also held three um, Zoom or updates and question and answer sessions via Zoom, uh, most recently last evening. And on two of those, very pleased to have Dr. Cushman attend with us, which again, I think uh, helps to put families' minds at ease to know that we are continuing to work very closely with our health unit. And on one of them, uh, Dr. Foote was able to cover for Dr. Cushman. We provide staff with those same communication updates as well. Um, we've had one Zoom meeting for all staff and then Jennifer has just hosted one for the staff on 3A uh, in particular as the unit most impacted. And then I've already touched on the daily meetings that we have. The next slide just reviews um, what's happening in terms of resident support given that uh, the home is closed to all visitors at this point, except for, uh, in the case if a resident was end of life. Um, so you'll see that uh, basically all the activities for the residents continue, but within uh, the uh, guidelines and parameters of the public health protocols. So very small uh, group activities on each home unit. If those residents like, for example, 3A, that's not possible because they are uh, quarantined to their room. Uh, for those residents, we have independent type activities and 
I've listed those on the slides, uh, the next slide. Um, but we also continue with all of the virtual type visits. Well, whether that's the old fashioned telephone, uh, a Zoom, Facebook, Skype, uh, window visits, all of those continue. And then as Jennifer has overviewed uh, the COVID care unit, we've also made sure that we have activities going on there as well. And as I've indicated, the virtual visits uh, continue. Um, the other group we're most concerned about is our staff. Uh, needless to say, this has been very discouraging, especially um, you know, having lost two residents and a more recent uh, outbreak, a more recent positive case rather where uh, we had thought we were uh, getting close to the outbreak being declared over. Um, so you'll see on the next slide, uh, we have uh, co consulted with our employee health coordinator, uh, Bev Zato. She's put together um, a number of supports for staff. Um, and so um, as Jennifer has indicated, we have two teams of staff, either the staff that are caring for the well residents, and we're very thankful they're holding down the fort, and then that team that have volunteered to be on the front line caring for our positive residents. So there's lots of ongoing re-education, those opportunities when the health unit comes in, when the regional IPAC team comes in to ask questions right to the experts, and then um, what I forgot to say yesterday in the meeting that uh, Jennifer uh, hosted with the staff of 3A, she also had a public health nurse with her as well. So again, it helps to put people's mind at ease where they can ask questions directly uh, to those experts. Okay, we'll just advance to the next slide. Um, and so, the next slide, uh, we have celebrated uh, those residents that have recovered. Um, and so uh, the resident, the staff have orchestrated uh, balloons and a, a bit of a ceremony and a welcome back uh, to those residents when they are discharged from the COVID care unit to their home unit. Um, and when Sean can advance to the next slide. you will see um, that we definitely uh, remember those residents that we've lost, not just at Miramichi Lodge, but across our province and across our country. And so uh, the home did take place, did take part rather in a candlelight vigil last week uh, to do just that. And so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation. If anyone has any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Sheedy, and also uh, Ms. White. Um, I, I uh, uh, was uh, incredibly impressed with the, the uh, video and uh, what it was doing, which was demonstrating the uh, a year's worth of planning, hoping to never have to put it into place, but being prepared in that event uh, provides a great deal of reassurance to me and I'm sure to the committee. And, and uh, I think that uh, anyone that, that is watching now and may watch this, uh, it has been my universal experience that in, the, uh, in an, an information vacuum, people fill that vacuum with information that they may create on their own. Uh, so I certainly commend you on this presentation and likewise, Ms. Shidi, on the overall presentation. I think providing that fact uh, provides reassurance. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, is uh, thank you. Uh, to both of you uh, as, as perhaps first, uh, but amongst a, a, an incredibly compassionate and dedicated and professional staff uh, that I'm sure are discouraged uh, using an old, uh, perhaps hackneyed, but you must play the game 60 minutes and COVID has demonstrated to us, uh, even though we, we went through what seemed to be the worst part of it and now the vaccines uh, had been completed, et cetera, uh, the moment you take your eyes off of the puck, uh, it has uh, an ability to to uh, catch you off guard. So I'm sure it has been discouraging, but I'm certainly encouraged at the fact that we have uh, such, as I said, compassionate and dedicated uh, staff on hand. The other thing is the precautionary principle that's been in place. Uh, it seems serendipitous. Uh, I'm sure everyone on this call has heard it repeatedly from uh, Dr. Michael Ryan, uh, the the uh, chief epidemiologist from the WHO, who has been constantly talking about the precautionary principle, and it has been demonstrated time and again 
uh, that it, the COVID moves faster than we do, that we need to be out in front of it. So I'm absolutely relieved uh, to see that we are at, and have been out in front of this at all times. So thank you. Now, committee, questions? Uh, Councillor Emo. Thank you. This is a, a great presentation, a very reassuring. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed with the, the thoughtfulness of it and putting it together, but also the caring and the compassion that's shown uh, to the to the residents as best we can. Um, I'm wondering if this is going to be, if this is going to be uh, focused on at County Council, perhaps we might want to consider sending uh, the YouTube link and the, you know, the approximate time out to all local councils so that they can view it um, as it's being presented. I think it's, I think this kind of reassurance needs to spread out into the community and, and, and I think this presentation does an excellent job of doing that. And rather than having Shelley and staff traipse out to all 18 municipalities, including our friends at the city, this might be a, a, a means of getting the information out. And then through councils individually, they can talk to their neighbors. Um, so that's my first point. My second point is I'm assuming there's a, there's a, a mimicked um, setup for Bonesher Manor as well. I, I know how thorough uh, Ms. Sheedy is. Uh, Ms. Sheedy? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to Councillor Emo. Um, yes, um, you know, concurrently, Bonisher Manor was, uh, has, has and, and was working on the pandemic plan as well. And in fact, in concert with Miramichi Lodge. I will say, though, that um, we, Miramichi Lodge benefited from the timing of the design of the facility because we'd already been through SARS and while Renfrew County wasn't impacted much by SARS, uh, definitely infection control was top of mind when those design decisions were being made. And I will tell you, you know, as somebody that worked at the old lodge with the four bedrooms and all the flu outbreaks that we had, um, when I came to the health committee of the day and county council and said, we need to optimize the number of private rooms to prevent infection spread, there was let's build the number the maximum number of private rooms and that's why we have 100 private rooms um, at Miramichi Lodge we have a fraction of that at Bonisher Manor um, all those design elements that uh, Jennifer overviewed uh, those were brought to the committee and council of the day because they all exceeded the ministry minimum standards and you as the funder as the key funder of the new Miramichi Lodge being the County of Renfrew and the City of Pembroke, you invested in that building that has put us in that position today. So all of that Councillor Emo to say that while we do have a similar plan at uh, Bonisher Manor, um, if God forbid we had more than one positive um, resident, I'm not sure that we would be able to care for them in house. We may have to look at transfer to hospital. And, and I do want to touch on that as well. Um, every resident or their substitute decision maker always has the opportunity to go to the hospital at any time. And COVID or non-COVID. And so um, there is a plan of care and the plan of care always talks about the goals of care and whether uh, you know that's conservative treatment at the home. But regardless of that, it's always discussed in the moment depending on what is happening. And so the residents that are in our COVID care unit today and have been uh, throughout this outbreak have all chosen to be cared for at the home. Had they have said, I'd like to be transferred to the hospital, we would have done that. Thank you. Uh, follow up, uh, Councillor Emo. Uh, just a general comment. Uh, thank you for that reassurance. And that's all I was trying to elicit with your answer. Thank you. Uh, if I might, uh, I'll address that first question. I will certainly defer, but I uh, anticipate that uh, both uh, uh, Warden Robinson and Mr. Morrow, uh, we can find uh, uh, the occasion at uh, County Council at the end of the month for uh, a reprise of this. I think it is something certainly that uh, uh, that uh, all of Council uh, would have benefit for and, and certainly picking up on uh, Councillor uh, Emo's uh, comments. Uh, I am fairly certain that we will not uh, be able to spare the time uh, as well for uh, Ms. Sheedy and Ms. White 
to take the show on the road, that that would be a fantastic opportunity. Uh, the second thing uh, that I wish to comment on is, is uh, you may be aware that there has been a discussion ongoing for some time. Certainly long-term care has been uh, the locus, if you will. Uh, I think just over 50% of, of uh, uh, fatal infections have been uh, within long-term care that there has been much discussion of for-profit versus not-for-profit. But uh, Ms. Sheedy, I think, uh, put her finger on it uh, more precisely. Um, just recently, uh, Dr. Bob Bell, a uh, former Deputy Minister of Health uh, for the province of Ontario, has done an analysis uh, wherein it is the domiciling and the ward uh, rooms uh, have been enormously problematic. Uh, uh, the vast majority of, of the uh, large outbreaks have happened within uh, that wart system, uh, along with uh, perhaps some some uh, antiquated uh, uh, HVAC systems. So uh, I certainly kudos. I am not going to receive those kudos that Ms. Shidi was providing there, but I am certainly going to extend them to the council of the day that uh, also was exercising the precautionary principle, even though they uh, perhaps had not uh, the notion that it was a precaution for 15 or 20 years down the road. But uh, I am enormously relieved uh, that they were pressing it at the time. Warden Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I definitely would be very pleased to have um, Ms. White and Ms. Sheedy at County Council at the end of the month. You know, Shelley has kept us, um, yourself and I, and and, um, and Mr. Morrow um, right up to date every day in what's happening. I'm extremely proud. And I think the rest of County Council needs to feel as proud as we are today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lafreniere and then Councillor Murphy. I want to compliment staff and management. Uh, uh, after seeing this presentation, I'm very confident. Um, I have an extended family member that works at the lodge and I, you know, I've had my concerns too and uh, this puts them at rest. What I do want to ask though is, um, even though you were proactive and you had all the right things in place for a very long time prior to the outbreak, what do you feel was the breach or do you know the origin of the breach that allowed the outbreak or is it just something that came into the building and nobody really could trace where it came from? Um, so I'm going to be very cautious in my response, um, Councillor Lafreniere, for privacy reasons. Um, but I will say that uh, the contact tracing, and in fact, if you recall, you know, our first point in the chronology, uh, we were uh, informed uh, that somebody that was a close contact of a resident had tested positive. So that's what allowed us to take that first step right from the get go, um, which I think we will, I hope, uh, you know, in when this is all over, we'll be able to say that had a huge impact on, you know, the 27 other residents that live on that unit, not all uh, contracting uh, COVID. Um, but other than that, that's all I can say. So just further to that, so obviously someone either came into the home that the quick rapid test didn't work on or was not really forthcoming with their symptoms if they had any, I guess. So, okay. Well, Sounds actually, um, through you, Mr. Chair, if I could just maybe if I um, explain it this way, because I, I did have a similar question from one of the families at Miramichi Lodge. And I explained it this way. Um, so at the time, uh, back uh, in mid-February, uh, rapid testing hadn't started yet. So um, family members coming into the lodge uh, would have a PCR test through VTAC uh, within 14 days before that visit. So we needed proof of the 14 day, you know, a negative result. And they also had to attest in those 13 days you know, since they had had the test that they, you know, it's all the regular screening qu questions. They hadn't come in contact. They had no symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, assuming the best that people are honest and, you know, answer those questions honestly, this is how easily and wily this virus is. So I could have, I could, I'm at work right now. Okay. I got screened this morning. I asked, answered all my questions truthfully. I have no symptoms. I go home tonight and I develop a symptom and I get tested and I'm positive. My contact tracing for the last 48 hours is I was in contact with A, B, C, and D. They're now high risk. 
if I could add to that uh, as well, uh, uh, Ms. Sheedy, um, these are not the, this, I guess this is a continuing outbreak since the first case, but it's not the first outbreak uh, at Miramichi Lodge. And we have also had an outbreak and bearing in mind in long-term care, an outbreak is one case. Uh, this is not the first outbreak at Miramichi Lodge, um, yet uh, it has wrought uh, this damage this time where it had not the previous times. And as Ms. Sheedy had said, has said, uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is perhaps the most uh, opportunistic and insidious uh, virus. Uh, it is uh, random as well, because uh, we certainly are, are made aware almost on a daily basis of, of uh, perhaps a failure to meet uh, the, the guidance requirements or, or the zones that we are finding ourselves in. But even when we are meeting all of those guidance targets, it still is that insidious. That, that is not a 100% barrier to COVID. Uh, and it has, as I said, an opportunistic element to it. Uh, and this is what we have found. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and uh, to Shelley and to Jennifer, um, yep, thank you for this presentation. It was you know, it was sad um, to see the halls of Miramichi um, empty. You know, normally when, when we're there, you see the residents, caregivers, you know, people are milling about and it's such a warm and welcoming feeling. So it was a bit haunting to see some of those photos that Jennifer presented. Um, I think you touched on it a bit, Shelley, but, uh, you know, we're hearing about physician fatigue, nursing fatigue. How are our staff doing seeing those haunting empty hallway photos? And, and um, for those residents that are not in isolation, how are they, like is, what is morale? I know that you, you listed all sorts of things. I'm, I'm very interested by the way in folding laundry. Um, I, that, I think that's a great activity. I find it, I like, folding laundry. So I think that's a fun activity. Um, but just in general, what's the mood at the lodge? Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Murphy. Uh, if I could ask Jennifer, uh, she's definitely closer to the residents and staff. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Murphy. So I would say that um, I have probably never been more impressed by the Miramichi Lodge team and how they have come together through this. So if you're following uh, social media, uh, some of our staff have uh, created a slogan, Miramichi Strong. Um, it's being you know, promoted amongst uh, each other. They are uh, cheering each other on. Um, the staff themselves, even outside of manager involvement, have taken collections amongst themselves and offered it to our COVID care team just to show their appreciation for each other. Um, that being said, uh, when we're getting close towards the end um, and then we have another positive case, that, that is discouraging. And we are so proud of all of the additional things that we're doing all, all the time to keep stuff, uh, like to keep everybody safe. Uh, so that is discouraging. But um, I think the team, um, you know, we, we took a lick and they've kind of picked themselves back up. Uh, they're coming together. And like Shelly said, we've done a lot to make sure that the team is involved. So for example, yesterday, speaking with the team on 3A, engaging them in the process, because those people are on the front line, they're going to identify gaps that, that we might not see. So um, we are going over and above and, and keeping people involved. Um, we are uh, having t-shirts made for all staff, Miramichi uh, strong. So uh, I think any encouragement that anyone can, can give the staff, but uh, truly a resilient and remarkable team that truly comes together. And, and I couldn't be more proud to work with the team here. And Mr. Chair, if I could just add to that, um, certainly the tone at any of our family meetings uh, via Zoom that we've had 
have always been incredibly supportive. And in fact, um, you know, last night it ended with uh, in the chat room, a series of, you know, thank the staff. We're so proud of you, you know, keep going, um, those kinds of things. So, you know, uh, Jennifer and company will make sure that is communicated to the staff. And we're in fact printing those out and we have a COVID board. We paste all of the nice cards and letters and, and things that we get. So again, thank you to Jennifer and the management team at the lodge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, and once again, I'm going to uh, give an enormous shout out uh, to the messaging, the communications outreach uh, that you have undertaken, Ms. White. Certainly in uh, the first several months uh, when, uh, when uh, the trauma was being visited upon long-term care, a common refrain that you were seeing in the media was that the families and loved ones uh, didn't know what was going on. They were unaware. Uh, nobody was communicating anything to them. Uh, I have said from the start that I think that the single largest uh, arrow that we have in our quiver battling COVID has been messaging and communications and being frank and transparent as much as we humanly possibly can. Uh, so thank you to that. I think that you have certainly met that bar. Uh, once more, uh, uh, committee, anything further? Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Ms. White. Uh, I am hoping that uh, we have crested and, uh, and that we are finding our way back out uh, of the outbreak, but uh, certainly extend on behalf of, uh, of committee council uh, and certainly the residents uh, of the county. I'm sure that the, the, uh, in all municipalities are probably represented at Miramichi Lodge. Uh, an enormous uh, thank you for all of your efforts to keep them safe and as well staff. Thank you. Thank you for all of your support. Uh, with that, then, uh, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Chief Nolan uh, to take us through the Emergency Services Department report, please. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today's Emergency Services report through you to members of committee uh, starts with uh, a review related to a presentation that was provided by um, Paramedic Chelsea Lanos and Commander Amber Haltink. They were invited by McMaster University to provide an overview of our program during the annual Innovations in Palliative Care uh, conference earlier this year. And we're very proud of obviously these two staff for representing us so well, but I would also like to add that we're very uh, proud of the paramedics uh, involved in this program, which includes effectively all paramedics that work with the service in that um, it's not unusual to have uh, a call for assistance related to a palliative patient. And uh, our goal is to stop the immediate knee-jerk reaction of taking them to hospital and in fact, provide them adequate care in the home. And I think that that's a key component. Uh, item number two is related to advancing community paramedicine uh, practice in response to COVID-19. Uh, Amber and her role as the commander of community programs uh, submitted an application um, to the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. Uh, and we have been accepted uh, for project proposal uh, with that organization to advance uh, the knowledge translation related to paramedics role uh, in COVID response. And of course, we've innovated in a number of areas uh, on the front line and 911 response through to community programs. So very pleased that that organization has acknowledged the, um, the work that we've done and wants to uh, continue to advance that. So working with the Canadian Standards Association uh, and working with uh, other services, uh, our goal here is to advance the program development for the use of uh, the tools that we've created for all paramedic services and make them available. So very proud of that. And a big thank you to you, Chair, Madam Warden, and all of uh, County Council uh, and the City of Pembroke for your support uh, over the past year. And I think that um, that that grant should allow us to be able to pull together those elements that uh, were really just ideas uh, in the early days of uncertainty and be able to bring them to fruition as um, not only lessons going forward, but I think uh, practices uh, overall. Item number three related to strategic plan goal number three uh, is related to our defibrillators. And as you know, we have 370 defibrillators throughout the community. And those of you that were with us uh, two years ago, uh, we had in a group uh, led by a physician um, in the um, Killaloo area, in fact, at the time in the Round Lake Property Association, 
And the goal was to test the concept of moving our automated external defibrillators from indoors to outdoors, where they are truly public access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I'm very pleased to show that um, Rob Blackwell, uh, our leader of this program, uh, has worked with that organization uh, through the grants for the Legion. We've been able to purchase four um, heated cabinets for this program, and the Property Owners Association uh, is purchasing five uh, or additional five outdoor cabinets. And the goal here is to look at that uh, area in its entirety. Certainly getting the defibs from indoors to outdoors is a first step. We're also looking at the use of our drone technology to be able to deliver automated external defibrillators by a drone uh, within that area because we have such a cooperative uh, community in that area that's very dedicated to uh, the use of automated external defibrillators. So I look forward to continue to advance that conversation with that uh, property association and that community of Killaloo, Hegarty and Richards as well. Uh, when we look at number four, the emergency management update, I think when we look on our lawns, uh, you know, we can see that grass is starting to come up and in some area crocuses. Uh, so certainly a happy uh, St. Patrick's Day in that regard. Uh, I do see significant rain in the forecast with hard ground and still some snow in the bush. So we're watching for Shet. Uh, Lee and his team in Public Works and Steve Ospenko are taking a lead so that he can uh, effectively watch the rear flank uh, of Frechette while we're in the midst uh, of a pandemic. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to work with our uh, partners in the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, our GIS department, uh, and others, and sharing that information and an opportunity to collaborate with all of the CEMCs across the county uh, and the city of Pembroke. So happy to continue to facilitate those conversations. And Steve is doing an exceptional job of keeping his finger on that pulse. Uh, item number five is related to VTAC uh, center update, and uh, it's related to goal number four within the strategic plan. So looking at uh, our role within uh, VTAC, certainly with the changes at the provincial policy level, it's, um, uh, it's a little bit of Groundhog Day. So every time a rule changes in Toronto, so too does our demand for COVID swabbing. So it's difficult to yo-yo uh, with the policy as it is difficult to yo-yo with what has become um, our day-to-day -day COVID activities. However, uh, one of the things that's important to note is when overnight we have a 100% increase in demand at our testing centers, we're trying to fill that capacity with our existing staffing model. So while the demand fluctuates uh, greatly, we attempt to fluctuate our staffing demands uh, in an incremental way to try and keep up with uh, at the public expectations, but also to be able to uh, not overreact every time a policy or rule changes, such as an important one related to uh, the number of symptoms required for school-aged children. Uh, you should also know that we've worked very closely with York University uh, for the creation of a simulator for our drive-through COVID uh, clinics, uh, particularly related to vaccination. And I think that it's important when we look at that through items number five and six, Mr. Chair, that uh, we have tested uh, the research that we've done with York University. So Jeff Dodge, one of our acting commanders, works daily with the researchers at York University in terms of the queuing theory and the engineering models related to uh, optimize the throughput related to our COVID clinics, but simultaneously decrease the number of staff and the number of touch points uh, in that process. Uh, it's one thing to throw everything you have uh, at a problem, such as how do we vaccinate the masses? It's another thing to create a sustainable solution from a staffing perspective. Uh, and we're very pleased to say that our throughput has been exceptional. Our average time uh, in our drive-through clinics, Mr. Chair, is 18 minutes. And that includes 15 minutes of wait time after the vaccination. So when we look at the success of that model in collaboration with an evidence-based approach, which we're doing with York University hand in hand, uh, we are the first center uh, in uh, Canada to do so. Uh, and in doing that, when we can have an average time um, of three minutes on site with 15 minutes of hold time, I think those are exceptional uh, results, knowing that the uh, want of the community is certainly to stay in their own vehicle, to be comfortable and to be able to move through a process uh, as quick, quickly as we do. We are doing that in collaboration, obviously, with the Redford County District Health Unit, with the, uh, the health 
uh, family health team folks uh, in Arnprior uh, and uh, other uh, health partners within the area, such as the hospital. But I think uh, it should also be stated that we're doing it at the high school. So the school board has also been a big partner as part of this process as well. And we're very pleased to do that. So we have, um, we have a draft uh, case study publication that I have shared with Ontario Health, uh, Indigenous Services Canada, the Red Cross, and other organizations uh, that are seeking uh, an optimized method. And you've, York University has come back to say that they would now like to study our implementation of their research and publish uh, on that as well. And Ontario Health uh, from the Southwest has also picked up on it and will be working with us on that. So we know that there are a number of different models that service different population needs. Our goal is to have the highest throughput with the least amount of um, staff involvement, obviously from a cost perspective, but also a sustainability uh, perspective. It's hard to get people um, to the numbers that you require to be able to maintain three, six, nine, potentially 12 months of sustainability in this model. So we're continuing to, to work that through and uh, we're very pleased with, with the results to date. I'm exceptionally proud of the staff, uh, the frontline paramedics, those that are in the staffing clinics or in the swabbing clinics that continue to diligently work in the background uh, and those that are innovating now on the, uh, on the vaccine front. When we look at vaccine accessibility, um, you know, this, the issues related to accessibility of vaccine are as variable as the day that this report is published. Uh, we hear uh, very clearly that there's not enough vaccine and then there's a whole bunch coming and we're not sure which kind, which changes the logistics and the throughput and the flow. So it's very interesting time to be able to uh, maximize the, the use of staff. But what I can say is that our commitment is to get as much geographic spread to the population as possible to serve our vulnerable populations first and to work in a collaborative uh, way with our health system partners. So when we look at that in terms of the services that we're providing, uh, paramedics right now are point on uh, congregate care settings, retirement homes, for example, uh, long-term care in collaboration with Shelly and their staff uh, have gone um, exceptionally well uh, as part of the process. However, uh, what I will say is that uh, we have yet to see the bulk of the population come through. And I think that's where we're going to be tested uh, most greatly. So that's why I want to keep high output, um, low input in terms of staff involvement and be able to maintain patient safety, patient confidentiality, and all the tenants of the services that we're providing. So we continue to uh, remain uh, on our toes on that one. And I think that overall it's going quite well. Uh, I understand that some of the... Um, uh, vaccination clinics at the hospitals are, are uh, delivering are going exceptionally well uh, as well for the populations that they're serving. So I'm very pleased to hear that um, the group effort is bearing fruit uh, for the population. Uh, when we look at item number C, Mr. Chair, looking at the uh, acting commander alternate CEMC roles that uh, Steve is playing, he's also part of the county command table. And our goal here is to get as much information from our county command table out to all local CEMCs as well. So there's information sharing obligation there that uh, Steve will be uh, a key listener on and sharing that information in his role as one of the regional leads as uh, my alternate CEMC for the county. When we look at deployment capacity um, and swabbing activities with the, with the yo-yoing I was speaking to earlier, uh, we now have a dedicated team uh, specifically for swabbing and that is going very well. I'm hearing very little uh, from that group despite the fact that demand has increased by 100% in the last three weeks. Uh, item number E uh, from section six is looking at a vaccination uh, news brief from RCBHU. And we just wanted to share that with members of committee in case they didn't pick up this information elsewhere, uh, Mr. Chair, because I think it's an important press release that we're all aware of the activities um, that are going on around us. Item number seven related to a logistics update. Um, there, we had received uh, N95s uh, from the province and, um, and which is a standard course of business. However, the province did flag that there were counterfeit uh, 3M N95s in the provincial supply chain. We did identify um, a number of those counterfeit uh, units within our supply chain. And this really comes back to the rigor of our logistics processes to be able to identify them, track them within our own system, 
uh, confirm in fact that we did have counterfeit N95s uh, as received from the province. And we were able to remove those uh, from stores. And in doing that, uh, we had not distributed those out to any staff. Um, through our uh, process management, um, I think that it proved that uh, our logistics staff are doing an exceptional job of receiving stock and being able to track that stock and then be able to report uh, its availability and utilization. Um, so you recall uh, last meeting where I was looking at uh, software related to these processes, and I think that can only strengthen uh, the work that, that my team are doing related to that logistics uh, process management. Uh, item number eight, some good news here. There's certainly an email commending the service on a call um, with partner agencies. There's a letter from uh, Member of Parliament Cheryl Gallant thanking staff for their work uh, and a very endearing card from Jason Stewart uh, sharing his birthday present uh, with frontline paramedic staff, Mr. Chair. Uh, those are all appended uh, to today's report as ES3. Uh, and then lastly, there is uh, an addendum to today's report, Mr. Chair. So uh, happy to uh, seek direction from you as to whether you'd like me to address that now uh, and deal with questions all at once, or whether you'd like to conclude here and then deal with the addendum separately. Uh, I think that uh, just bear with me as I'm uh, going back and forth from my various devices here to figure out where we are. Uh, yeah, so this is a resolution. Uh, item number nine, which is part of the addendum. So perhaps we will hold that in abeyance uh, and we will return to the uh, start uh, of the emergency services report. Uh, and I would invite from uh, committee uh, any questions or comments. Just bear with me. Uh, thank you, Chief Nolan, for a very comprehensive report uh, as well. Uh, committee, any uh, questions, comments on item one, palliative care model? Uh, I'm just going to comment, uh, Chief Nolan, once again, this is the Swiss Army knife uh, that is delivering true patient-centric care. Uh, as you have said, uh, typically hospitals have been the, the catch-all uh, in the absence of, of uh, alternate services. And I'm often reminded of, of um, uh, every issue is a nail if all you have is a hammer. So I'm very pleased to actually be able to uh, release some of the various elements to that Swiss Army knife. By the way, too, I think your décolletage could be more revealed. I am going to commend you on your attire this morning. Um, item number two, uh, advancing community paramedicine practice. Uh, item number three, the Renf County of Renfrew AED program. Uh, I'm just going to commend, as you did, uh, Chief Nolan, um, both the Round Lake Property Association and uh, Killaloo Haggerty Richards of, of uh, uh, being out front in this uh, issue, uh, have been out front in this issue for some time and certainly setting a high bar for the, uh, the uh, rest of our community, uh, truly making these uh, life-saving devices uh, more accessible and readily available. Um, committee, item number four, the emergency management update. Uh, item five, VTAC testing center update. Uh, item six, the vaccine rollout. Uh, certainly on A, uh, very pleased to hear the engagement, uh, Chief Nolan of, uh, of York University and the uh, um, initiative towards optimizing. And I think uh, you certainly mentioned uh, staff of how do we deliver the biggest bang for the smallest buck uh, of uh, uh, the, the least a number of people uh, that are required to deliver this vaccine. But at the same time, it seems also that it is providing the least amount of exposure to any of the residents of our community. So I am certainly uh, much enthusiastic about the optimization. I get that uh, as we have stood up essentially uh, Amazon uh, in, in a couple of months to deliver the vaccine, uh, it is certainly a worthy endeavor to, to now begin to uh, make it much more efficient. Uh, Warden Robinson, please. Thank you very much, Chair. So the um, provincial wide booking system went live, I believe Monday afternoon. So I'm just wondering whether or not Chief Nolan can, can share with us um, if it's had any impact at all on the number of calls being um, for people booking vaccine appointments through the, uh, the VTAC 211 system. Uh, just before Chief Nolan does, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, there was, um, uh, I'm not sure how many of the committee may be aware, uh, last week there was an outreach uh, through all of our uh, CEMCs, uh, perhaps also CAOs, 
uh, from the the um, uh, vaccine communication uh, teams, uh, and certainly within uh, Admaster Bromley, we have four staff uh, alternately through the week. I know that uh, that uh, uh, several municipalities, I think almost all of the municipalities, do have volunteers that have stepped forward. Uh, this is in order primarily just to respond to those who who uh, would phone in and will not have access to. Um, uh, internet and and to be able to make online registrations. Having said that, uh, what I just saw yesterday is that uh, uh, the province is directing those who would uh, from our community uh, or represented within the Renfrew County and District uh, catchment area is directing them to the local uh, number. So so there will that right now there are not, as I understand it, two parallel. Uh, booking systems, but perhaps Chief Nolan, you can shed some more light on that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the question, Madam Warren. That is my understanding as well. Um, uh, I think that there's already enough confusion in the public and in the system in terms of uh, what's their prioritization, who do they call. Uh, you know, we do have uh, some fragmentation within the county in terms of uh, the availability of vaccination, the different clinics you go to, who you get a hold of. I've seen that most of the clinics in the county are now putting people back into the RCDHU uh, process. So I think that there's still some opportunity in terms of the coordination of these functions. But I think overall, people are now seeing some choice, which I think is positive. I've heard people, you know, ask me, uh, you know, should I be driving to Kingston because they're now serving my age group? Uh, versus uh, staying here locally. So there's there's a lot of shopping around going on. And, um, but I, I am pleased to hear that, um, that there is not a lot of, uh, once you're in the system, there's not a lot of confusion as to how you get booked, where you get booked, when you get booked or showing up. I think that that part's going quite well. In terms of the provincial involvement, I'm happy to hear that they're pointing people back to the local. Um, but it always does stand a risk in terms of uh, knowledge related to what is what is local and what is your best choice and your closest choice to home. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Warren. Thank you. Follow up, Warden Robinson. Thank you. And, you know, again, I'm not going to miss a meeting where I don't say Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Center. So here we go. But again, I mean that this is a number that people know. And so I think it's crucial that that message get out. And I and um, the information you said today, Chair, about um, the province saying use your local um, communications, um, I didn't know that. So I think it's really important because I was very concerned that um, once, you know, we have something set up here that works for the County of Renfrew and the residents know about it. So as long as we can maintain our little you know, little bubble here and, and serve the needs of our residents through the BTAC system and the num the five tables that are being set up to distribute the vaccine. I think that's the be very best uh, scenario for the residents of the county. Uh, thank you, uh, Warden Robinson. And I can advise that, uh, in fact, it was my, uh, my staff, uh, my elected staff, my chief of staff, actually, Stephanie Dynan, uh, who showed me uh, where she had access to the provincial site and right on the provincial site, it directed, there was a, a hot link directly back to rcdhu.com. Uh, so to, at this point, uh, it appears to be seamless. Uh, I also want to express, I think that initially uh, there was anticipation that perhaps VTAC and the VTAC telephone number uh, might be the means whereby the, the local registry would happen. As I understand it, uh, it is not that, or, or let me be more precise, it is not that. Uh, as I understand it, I believe this is being backstopped through PRH, uh, the telephone number, and what the staff of, the volunteer staff from the various municipalities are, are engaged primarily to respond to those who register by telephone that may not have access to internet. And that is a means of, of making it more equitable uh, and available to all. Warden Robinson. That is, that is definitely news to me because I had understood that the phone system that was using, they were using was the 211 number that we had through VTAC, but um, I really appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Um, anything further, and I'm going to go through this uh, letter by letter, anything further on A? Thank you. And anything on B, vaccine accessibility? 
Uh, Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Chief Nolan. Um, Mike, are you being given sort of a heads up when you might get vaccines or are we all still in this boat of, we have no idea what we're getting, when we're getting them or how many. Um, I think that it's fantastic that you've got a complement of staff that are ready to go. And you know we know our, our docs are ready to go and our nurses are ready to go, but without the vaccine, we're sort of in a void here. So, um... What we're getting right now is two weeks at a time. So our runway is not long in terms of understanding uh, what that capacity looks like. And even at that, there's some, there's some flexibility, some nuance as part of the process uh, because it's not only what you're getting as a bulk, it's where is it gonna go? Which arms is it gonna go in? Um, you know, with AstraZeneca coming on board uh, and other products, now we're looking at uh, some variability in terms of the logistics and the supply chain associated with that. Uh, because, of course, the handling of Moderna is different from Pfizer, is different from AstraZeneca and so on. So it's, it, it is a fairly complicated piece of business in the back end, but we have better line of sight than we did. It could certainly be much better. But I think given, you know, the global uh, competition uh, for vaccine and then the allocation in terms of, um, of its distribution by municipality, by age group, uh, by indigenous group and so on. Um, we're, we're absolutely building the plane as we fly here. So, uh, you know, any understanding and patience associated with that is appreciated. Our CDHU, I believe, is doing their level best in terms of keeping everybody up to speed as to what's what at any given moment. But uh, as has been the case for the past 12 months, um, just when you think you know something, it's, it's wrong. So we're still working with it. Thank you, Chief Nolan. Yes, uh, COVID has, has an underlying skill of, of pulling the rug out from un under us and making us look foolish, even those, those of us who think we, we are beginning to understand. Um, item C. Uh, and finally, item 6E. Uh, moving on then to uh, item seven, the logistics update. Uh, very pleased uh, that these were uh, um, uh, set aside. Uh, I know that uh, on the emergency call, uh, Chief uh, Deputy Chief Leahy uh, said at this point, we are uncertain uh, whether there is, is uh, any utility in these uh, uh, contraband, if you will, uh, masks. Do we have uh, any more messaging on whether they can be repurposed on something that perhaps is not frontline health? Uh, no, not at this time. And I, and I think that they're probably best suited for a uh, bonfire at this point. Um, when it's counterfeit, it's counterfeit. So uh, I wouldn't be risking uh, the impression that they're good for anything because we don't know what they were made for. Okay, thank you. Uh, item eight, uh, the uh, letters of gratitude. Uh, okay, then we'll take it to the addendum, uh, Chief Nolan, and item number nine. Sure, item number nine. Related to the Brentford County Virtual Triage and Assessment Center Reserve, uh, there is a recommendation here, Mr. Chair, that Health Committee recommend to County Council the creation of a uh, reserve and the transfer of any uh, financial surplus into reserve at the end of 2020. Um, in discussion with uh, finance, I believe that we should... Um, make generic uh, the title of the reserve to a community paramedic reserve because we do have multiple uh, inputs in terms of funding that can be uh, rolled over to be able to provide an assurance in terms of uh, covering our financial requirements related to community paramedicine and the VTAC COVID efforts. Uh, you will recall that um, the province did also allocate um, uh, millions of dollars uh, related to COVID related expenses. So as we reconcile those expenses, finance has done a great job of identifying um, where we can utilize the various funding sources to cover our COVID related costs uh, and where we have the ability to uh, carry those funds forward uh, to uh, cover off any future liabilities related to 
uh, previous expenses. So the background on this obviously is that we had signed an agreement with ARH and we are effectively a contractor to Empire Regional Hospital for services. And we did that at flat rate billing uh, of $1,000 a day for paramedic and $500 a day for non-paramedic staff. In that regard, when we talk about a day, we typically talk about a 12 hour day, not an eight hour day where we have an eight hour day. Uh, the numbers are uh, commensurately uh, reduced based upon uh, the ratio and proportion of time spent and the costs associated with that. So um, uh, with this reserve account, um, as uh, Jeff and his team are able to identify exact amounts as we go forward, um, we should be able to put uh, county uh, and city uh, dollars uh, in reserve uh, based upon 100% revenue from exterior sources, um, such as uh, VTAC. We also do receive donations, as you know, uh, related to automated external defibrillators, uh, and there are other revenue opportunities related to community paramedicine, where I believe it's in our best interest to carry uh, funds when uh, we're able to, and it's appropriate to do so, to be able to cover off uh, any future liabilities given the turbulence of time, the times that we're living in. So uh, with this, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll hand the resolution back to you and any questions. Uh, thank you. I think the first thing, uh, uh, committee, uh, I will read the resolution, seek a mover and a seconder, and then open it for discussion. So I will read the recommendation uh, that the health committee recommend to county council the creation of a community paramedic reserve and the transfer of any VTAC financial surplus into this reserve at the end of 2020. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Emo. Discussion. Uh, perhaps, and I uh, will also invite uh, Mr. Foss um, um, to comment where appropriate. Uh, is this anticipated to be a restricted reserve then that the funds uh, would uh, be, be allocated uh, in 2021 uh, towards those initiatives that are funded through the VTAC? And, uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, an answer to that uh, question. Uh, yeah, this would certainly be a restricted reserve and for the for the purposes identified in the resolution for community paramedic purposes. Um, as uh, Chief Nolan has indicated, this is a shared reserve so that uh, any surplus dollars, you know, that we are creating from this reserves are essentially county city dollars. Uh, so must be restricted uh, to be used only for county city shared programs which of course would be our paramedic services and community uh, paramedic programs. So restricted, yes, uh, and uh, uh, certainly co-owned co co -owned by the County of Renfrew and the City of Pembroke. All right, thank you. Just one follow-up. So, so uh, these, these funds advanced through the, the Empire Regional Hospital that has been essentially the banker for the VTAC program then, uh, have been provided uh, from the provincial government. So there is not an anticipation or an expectation of reconciliation, but a, a continued uh, usage of these for the VTAC. Well, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, so our agreement uh, is uh, directly with the Arm Prayer Regional Hospital, and we're both seen as independent contractors. So in reviewing that agreement, uh, we have the ability or capacity to bill in accordance with the agreement, which was that flat rate billing system. Uh, so uh, as Chief Nolan has indicated, any surplus dollars uh, accrue to the benefit of us as the contractor. And so that's our position that we are taking at the end of 2020 uh, and therefore uh, um, bringing forward this resolution to create this restricted reserve to be used in future fiscal periods. And as the committee is aware, we do have a surplus deficit policy. Uh, so without this resolution to restrict this surplus and dedicate it to community paramedic activities, uh, any surplus that's created within paramedic services then would fall through to our working capital reserves, you know, to be used for infrastructure renewal in a future period in time. So therefore the staff recommendation that we hang on to these dollars and dedicate them to future community paramedic related activities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything further committee? All in favor. That is carried. Thank you. 
Uh, with that, then, I think that that concludes the emergency services report. So I would now invite a motion to accept the emergency services report, please. Moved by Councillor Bennett, seconded by Councillor Grills. Any further final questions? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chief Nolan, uh, for the report. Prior to us uh, beginning the long-term care report, uh, perhaps it is, it is an appropriate time. I am showing uh, 1054. Uh, I would like to take a break uh, and uh, resume at um, 1105. That should give us 10 minutes. Uh, should be time enough. So uh, with that, Mr. Banke, uh, if you could advise.
Uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience, uh, and hopefully everyone uh, was able to uh, stretch their legs, uh, re-engage, uh, and here we find ourselves again. Ms. Sheedy, I am going to yield the floor to you once again for the long-term care report, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The report starts on page 16 of your package. Items number one and two are the resident statistics for each of Onisher Manor and Miramichi Lodge as of uh, the end of February 2021. Um, you will note that there is an asterisk besides, beside the occupancy rate. And just a reminder uh, to committee that we are not being held uh, to maintain that 97% occupancy uh, re, um, average. Um, and I will have more on that later in the, in the uh, package. And then on the respite numbers, again, uh, the province has directed all homes to pause on respite admissions at this time. Item number three is the Lynn Home and Community Care client waitlist information for the nine long-term care homes in Renfrew County. Um, because those numbers don't change much month to month, uh, we thought it best that we will, uh, going forward, provide those on a quarterly basis. Item number four is the COVID pandemic upbreak, outbreak. Uh, we've already, you have uh, an up-to-date uh, status report as of this morning uh, through the delegation. Uh, with respect to the second bullet, um, which is consistent with goal number four of our strategic planning and optimizing technology, I did touch as well uh, during the presentation on using the COVID screening app. Uh, you also have uh, up-to-date information on the vaccination um, as of this morning for Miramichi Lodge. Uh, we will provide the stats uh, at our next meeting for Bonisher Manor. I will tell you they are not quite as high. Um, so we are experiencing a Bonisher Manor where we've had an outbreak. There is actually greater uptake. Uh, having said that, we will continue to work with resident staff and essential caregivers, again, that principal, anyone that can have the vaccine to strongly encourage them to have it. Um, with respect to our occupancy targets, um, as I've indicated, uh, the government has said that they will freeze on the requirement to meet the 97% average uh, until March 31st. First, and of course, today is the 17th. We were required to provide them with an occupancy plan to fill any vacant beds. Um, actually, it was due last Friday on March 12th. And then on Friday, March 12th, we were told we had an extension to March 31st. Uh, so I do anticipate um, that um, relief will be extended past March 31st. Um, for our two homes, um, the Manor for the summer onwards has strived to have about, to maintain about four empty beds, two long-term care and two respite to manage the ongoing suspect uh, resident cases that we have so that we have a private room or an empty room to isolate them in until we get that test result back. The lodge does the same, but of course, having given that they have been in, in outbreak since February uh, 22nd, um, there's a, a large double digits, uh, I think we're upwards of about 14 or 15 empty beds at this time. Uh, so once uh, the lodge is out of outbreak, we'll make a concerted effort to fill those beds as well. Um, this is a push uh, across the province, uh, particularly for the challenge in hospitals uh, with the flow that has been stopped, uh, given that many homes did pause on admissions and perhaps has, haven't restarted at all or very slowly. We are aware of some homes, for example, that have complete units that are empty. Um, and so I just want to reassure you that uh, had Miramichi Lodge not been in an outbreak, we keep the um, most minimal number so that we can safely isolate. Uh, but we are a team player in terms of the healthcare system, and we know the importance of keeping that flow going uh, from both the community and the hospital. Uh, the next bullet point is our, what has been our prevention containment uh, and funding happening on a monthly basis. Uh, the government hasn't committed to it ever on an ongoing basis, but we have been receiving it monthly since last March. Uh, they did change the formula, increase the formula. 
Um, and I did uh, relate that back to goal number one and advocacy, both on your part as elected officials, as well as Advantage Ontario, uh, in recognition from the fact that, to the fact that most homes uh, were experiencing deficits uh, because of the increased costs related to COVID. Uh, so the new formula is there and you can see that for the months of January and February, Bonisher Manor, just by the nature of having more beds than, than the lodge, received $140,800, whereas the lodge uh, received $131,600. Item number five is a, just an update on the provincial staffing plan that was released in December. You will recall that a key component of it is that move towards an average of four hours of care uh, per resident per day. And what has been long identified uh, in this ask is that we need the resources to actually provide that care. And so I'm sure you've seen in the media uh, that the province has a, approved for the year 2021, an accelerated program available through all the community colleges that is going to be tuition free for the students. So the government is paying, uh, covering the cost of tuition. Uh, so that's great news for Renfrew County. And so as I've summarized what that means for us locally and our local campus of Algonquin College. So we have the regular college year that runs September to April. They continue to run that program, although much of it is virtual right now because of COVID, um, but it's typically on site on campus beside a Miramichi Lodge from September to April. Um, as you well know, the manors had this, we're in our third consistent year of doing an accelerated program and it's on site at Bonisher Manor currently running. It starts January. Those graduates will be finished in June and we hope to hire as many as we need. And so the two additional ones as a result of this new funding are May to November and June to December. So there'll be a total of four um, uh, um, intakes for the PSW program. And I think hopefully, uh, you know, that'll greatly uh, assist with the recruitment and retention of PSWs. Item number six is an inspection that occurred at Miramichi Lodge and the link is there for the public document. Item number seven is an update on fundraising, including uh, the two latest butterfly bulletins for each of our homes as well as uh, we received some very generous donations recently, uh, one to Bonisher Manor from the McLaren family in the amount of $10,000 in honor of past uh, family members that have lived at the manor. So thank you to them. And uh, similarly from the Miramichi Lodge Auxiliary who also donated $10,000 to the lodge. And that is for the implementation of the butterfly approach. So gratefully accepted. Similarly are the expressions of gratitude that we receive on an ongoing basis. And I try to select one to bring to your attention from each home. And so A is one for Bonisher Manor and B is one for Miramichi Lodge. And then that brings us Mr. Chair to the two bylaws in my report. Uh, item number nine, I'll read the recommendation that the health committee recommend that county council authorize the warden and chief administrative officer slash clerk to sign the extending letter to the long-term care service accountability agreement until March 31st, 2022 and the annual schedule E, which is the form of compliance declaration issued pursuant to the ELSA agreement for each of Bonisher Manor and Miramichi Lodge. And further that County Council approve a bylaw to amend bylaw 15-20, being a bylaw authorizing the warden and clerk to continue the long-term care service accountability agreement, including the compliance declaration with the LIN at their next session. So as committee will recall, uh, this is something that we do, that you do annually, and uh, this sign the compliance declaration. And I can confirm that to the best of my knowledge, we continue to be compliant in every area. And so it would be my recommendation uh, that the warden and the CAO sign this. Did you want me to stop there, Mr. Chair, for a mover and a seconder? Uh, thank you. Yes, you, uh, you read in my mind, uh, Ms. Sheedy. Thank you. Uh, can I have a mover, please? Uh, Councillor Frenier, seconded by Councillor Bennett. Uh, any discussion, comment? All in favor? 
That is carried. Thank you. And on to item number 10, please, Ms. Sheehy. Thank you. And that is the Bonisher Manor Senior Adult Day Program. And similarly, there's an MSA agreement for any organizations that run a community program uh, with the LIN. So the recommendation is that the Health Committee recommend that County Council authorize the Warden and Chief Administrative Officer slash Clerk to sign the extending letter for the extension of the MSA agreement from March 31st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022 between the Champlain Lynn and the Corporation of the County of Renfrew Bonisher Manor for compliance with the L, um, sorry, the Local Health Integration System Integration Act for submission by the deadline of March 31st, 2021, and further the County Council approve a bylaw to amend bylaw 1620 being a bylaw authorizing the warden and the clerk to continue the MSA agreement at their next session. And uh, similarly, you're aware we've run an adult day program, uh, both on site here at the Manor and in Cobden uh, since May, 2021. However, they are both on pause uh, during the pandemic, although we are uh, taking steps to get them started again when it is safe to do so. And so similarly, it is my recommendation that uh, the warden and the CAO uh, sign this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sheedy. Once again, committee, I would invite a mover, please. Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Grills. Uh, once again, committee, any question, comments? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Uh, with that, then, uh, committee, we will just bear with me as I return to uh, the beginning. Uh, and invite any questions, comments on item number one, the manor resident statistics. Item number two, the lodge resident statistics. Item three, the uh, Champlain uh, Lynn waitlist information. Um, certainly uh, confirm uh, Ms. Sheedy as this is, is uh, relatively unchanging uh, month to month uh, that I think it's appropriate uh, as we're probably by time looking for means of, of uh, um, condensing perhaps committee meetings uh, that this one would not certainly be missed if it was to, to uh, move to a quarterly report. Thank you. Uh, item number four, the pandemic update, and I will invite questions per bullet. On the first bullet with respect to the lodge outbreak, I think we've probably uh, done this one to completion. We have uh, surveillance and symptomatic testing. Uh, the vaccinations. Uh, I was remiss, uh, Ms. Sheedy, I wanted to, uh, in the uh, delegation report uh, of earlier this morning, I certainly wanted to uh, commend uh, both residents and staff for an outstanding uh, uptake uh, of the vaccine. I know that we have experienced that uh, with respect to the flu vaccine as well, uh, but we are in uh, a perhaps more uncertain or, or perhaps skeptical climate. Uh, very pleased at the uptake, uptake uh, that was shown uh, at both, uh, both the manor and at the lodge. Uh, the continued suspension of the long-term care occupancy target. Uh, the prevention and containment funding. Uh, provincial long-term care staffing plan. Uh, once again, just a, a single comment, it has been uh, ever elusive, ever aspirational, uh, the uh, uh, four-hour um, care. Uh, it's been a target forever, uh, probably since the time that you have uh, we are getting to that uh, since the time that you have uh, been with the uh, County of Renfrew, I'm assuming, Ms. Sheedy. So very pleased uh, that it is no longer notional and no longer even within a five-year plan, uh, but that we are commencing right now uh, to move us in that direction. So very pleased at that. Uh, item number six, the uh, inspection report for Miramichi Lodge. Uh, item seven, the uh, fundraising. Item A, uh, first, the Butterfly Bulletin. Uh, item B, the uh, uh, B and C, we will say, the uh, outstanding generosity, certainly of the uh, McLaren family and, and absolutely all of the efforts of the auxiliary uh, raising monies uh, for, for uh, long-term care. 
And finally, uh, committee, the expressions of gratitude. Just as uh, Ms. Sheedy, I heard you saying that you had to pick one. Uh, I think that this is probably like the, uh, the uh, winning ticket in a lottery where the, the drum is turned and you reach into the letters of gratitude. Certainly, um, you can count, I think, on me to be providing a letter of gratitude to each home for the outstanding efforts uh, that have been stood up by our staff in COVID-19. I don't know that I have the words to express the, uh, the gratitude that I have towards that. Uh, with that then, uh, committee, uh, can I have a mover to accept the long-term care report as a whole? Uh, Councillor Emo, seconded. Councillor Bennett, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. Uh, with that then, uh, Mr. Morrow, uh, if you could take us through the administration report, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two items for the administration report. The uh, first item is a uh, letter uh, dated February 12th from Ms. Sheedy uh, announcing her uh, upcoming retirement. So congratulations to Shelly. I, you know, we, um, um, we continue to talk and uh, I continue to express my concern as to what happens when she leaves. Um, she's most sort of certainly going to be missed. I mean, you know, the, her leadership uh, in long-term care um, is second to none. And, um, you know, we know that and we have realized that for some time. So uh, we appreciate all the uh, years of service. I think 25 with us, Shelly, and, um, you know, well done and congratulations um, to you on your um, upcoming retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, would you like me to move on to item number two? Yes, I would, please, Mr. Morrow. I am assuming that we will uh, return to item number one and we will hear comments from the committee. Okay, thank you, Chair. Item number two is an update we just received, um, I believe, last week with respect to the Ontario Health Team application process. Um, if uh, committee recalls, um, prior to COVID-19, the County of Renfrew stood up an ad hoc committee um, really to provide some um, support and uh, a little bit of lobbying with respect to this initiative. Um, the earlier application that was being pursued, I see there were four earlier applications that were being pursued. And um, I think that, um, you know, based on the work of the ad hoc committee and others, um, we've had um, some progress. You will see in this update, it will now be a joint application between uh, Deep River, um, PRH, uh, the Barry's Bay Hospital, which was the original Highway 60 corridor that included Barry's Bay and Renfrew. Um, and uh, so now it will be a joint application. And um, I, I believe they have a name for the group. Um, it would be the, if I can just look here. Yeah, I, I guess they didn't settle on a name, but uh, um, there is um, some, most certainly some movement in terms of moving it the right way. I would say that um, an area that remains a cause for concern um, is, um, you know, the waiting in terms of um, the uh, the hospital sector uh, continuing to play that role. I understand absolutely why, but uh, you know they have the resources and the financial capacity and capability to lead the application process. Um, but I would let you know that um, last week, uh, last Friday. At the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, um, the wardens identified uh, healthcare and healthcare transformation as a new priority um, for the um, Wardens Caucus for 2021. And the basis of that new priority will be one, governance and municipal representation on Ontario health teams. Um, so, again, uh, taking up that cause. And again, um, you'll know where this one is coming from the second component of the healthcare priority will be virtual healthcare. And um, so we will be advocating for the continuation of innovative ideas like VTAC uh, across Eastern Ontario. So um, those are uh, two elements of that new priority that the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, will be taking on. Chair, I'll leave it at that. That is my, um, the, that is the administration report. Thank you very, very much. Very concise report. Very much appreciative. There are extra points for concision. Uh, committee, uh, let us return uh, to item number one. I anticipate uh, that there are going to be multiple hands. I will recognize first Councillor Murphy. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Paul, this is one of those letters that I would have said, I didn't get it. I didn't get your letter. It must have gone to my spam mail. I mean, come on, man. Once you acknowledge it, it's real. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what exactly happened. And Shelly um, is going to laugh. Um, she called me to tell me I was getting the letter. I got the letter. And then she called me to say, you got my letter, right? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no okay. <laughs> so all joking aside, and I know that a couple of people are going to laugh when I say this, but um, Shelly, I could not, when I was the warden, I could not have asked uh, for a better uh, deputy or acting CAO, you know, when, when um, during the flooding, you know, you and I will always have our military helicopter presidential experience. Um, you know, as my, as a family member, I know we won't lose touch, but you are going to be so greatly missed um, by all of us. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you, uh, Councilor Murphy. <laughs> uh, uh, understood, and, and I will extend that uh, provision uh, to any councillor that sees fit. Uh, councillor uh, Mayor LeMay, and then I will go to Councillor Lafreniere, please. Uh, Shelley, first of all, congratulations you know, on your retirement. And you will be greatly missed because I've enjoyed working with you since I've been mayor of the city of Pembroke. So on behalf of the city, um, uh, you really are going to be missed. And, and uh, the one thing I really appreciated was not only your professionalism, but being able to communicate with you. And uh, you always, you're always there to answer the questions. And I really did appreciate that. So all the best in your future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor LeMay. Councillor Lafreniere. Really, I just want to echo what's been said especially um, uh, Jennifer Murphy. Uh, I don't think we got that letter. <laughs> I think there's a freeze on retirement. <laughs> but anyway, in all seriousness, I wish you the best in your retirement. I know that you'll live life to the fullest and enjoy your retirement, but uh, there is a position open then if you want to reapply. <laughs> Thanks. Good luck, enjoy. Thank you, Councillor Lafreniere. Uh, anything further? committee. Uh, Councillor Emo and then Councillor Bennett. Yes, uh, congratulations, Shelley. I, I hope, uh, I, I, know, I know we'll see you in the community. Um, you've got too many talents, too many skills and a sense of curiosity that won't allow you to, to disappear. Um, I've always appreciated your honesty. I've appreciated across all aspects of the municipal corporation and, and uh, in any of my roles in the past, I've certainly depended upon you to offer me uh, an honest and and uh, very accurate appraisal of, of uh, what is going on and uh, a, ch a challenge. And I say that it was a very gentle challenge whenever I suggested something, and especially if I was going in the wrong direction, you, uh, you often helped redirect me uh, in a very positive manner. Uh, and usually uh, and always, I should say, to my benefit and the benefit of whoever I was working for. So thank you very much for that. I'm certainly going to miss that. Um, I'm certainly going to miss sitting, having a quiet, uh, a quiet drink with uh, you while uh, the rest of our friends are terrorizing the uh, lobby at the Sheridan. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Evo. Councillor Bennett, please. I too, Shelley, want to thank you. I, I've known you for a very short time, actually, because I, I, this is my first term on county council. But I found they have that the information that you're supplying is what it was very intensive and, and very informative. So we uh, we go. I could go away from the health committee meetings knowing full well they have that everybody in Renfrew County Healthcare was being very well looked after. And knowing full well, if I didn't have the answer said that I certainly could rely on you to supply me with the information I needed fairly quickly. So I hope you have a very happy and a very long retirement. Thank you. Councillor Doncaster, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, Shelley, thank you very much for everything that you've, everything that you do and everything that you have done. Your professionalism is second to none. 
and um, congratulations and good luck with your retirement. Uh, and Councillor Grills, please. Shelley, we're going to miss you very, very much. And I, I want to give you some advice. Please don't volunteer for anything for at least a year. <laughs> you take care and I'm sure we will see you popping up. Have you given any thought to the Winter Games? <laughs> Uh, thank you to all, uh, Ms. Shidi. Please disregard that final bit of advice. Uh, the, the, um, uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, I have certainly mentioned this uh, to you, Shelley, that uh, uh, as I'm walking by the uh, plaque uh, from the time of the, uh, the uh, building of Miramichi Lodge and opening of Miramichi Lodge, uh, all those uh, from the County of Renfrew associated with that building are, are now departed uh, and the final departure will be yours. Uh, I believe yours is the last to name that is affixed to the wall uh, at Miramichi Lodge. Uh, I note in your uh, letter of resignation, which Paul assured me that I was, I did not have the authority to reject, uh, though I tried multiple times, um, that uh, uh, you've been here 25 years, uh, that's a quarter of a century, and the uh, the impact that you have had, not just on, on the County of Renfrew long-term care home, but the County of Renfrew long-term care across all nine homes and your contribution towards that and your outreach uh, within that community. And of course, more broadly to the residents of this community, I think that there is scarcely a family uh, in Renfrew County that has not um, had a, 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 a loved one family member at either Miramichi or at Bonnishare Manor. Uh, so it is an astonishing career. You have touched an enormous number of lives. Uh, and I will note also within your letter, uh, you mention a, a debt of gratitude. The debt is entirely uh, to the the, uh, and the corporation of the County of Renfrew and the residents of the County of Renfrew. That, any debt that you may have incurred has been long since extinguished and paid off. Uh, that there is uh, no longer an outstanding uh, amount owing on this. Uh, the final uh, uh, perspective from me, having sat in this chair uh, over two years now, is, is the reflected glory or the ease with which it is to occupy the chair of the Health Committee of the County of Renfrew uh, when you have uh, someone of such dedication and professionalism and compassion. And not only that, uh, certainly uh, um, amongst all of your colleagues and most of whom uh, the directors are on this call, that fine line uh, that you all must walk of, of you do not operate whatsoever in a political realm, but it is impossible for you to, to fulfill your obligation to this corporation without certainly being aware of it. And from both of those perspectives, uh, your advice and recommendations and sounding board has been unparalleled. Uh, so deepest appreciation, uh, it has been an honor uh, to have been the chair of the health committee uh, to have shared some of that time uh, in that 25 career of your, uh, year career of yours. Uh, so it is certainly with an incredible amount of regret uh, that I will uh, accept uh, your letter of resignation. There is a, a part of me uh, is suspicious that perhaps the warden had, had uh, uh, intentionally uh, had an appointment today so as to not have to go through this twice, uh, given that uh, we will be entertaining this again, I'm fairly certain, at County Council, So, uh, and, and I am certainly understanding of that. So, uh, again, very long-winded, but I don't think I could have expressed it with any fewer words. Thank you, Shelley, for your commitment to this, this, uh, this County of Renfrew. And Shelley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to you and all of Health Committee, I uh, certainly don't have anything prepared to say uh, today. I uh, do still have uh, a three months or thereabouts uh, that I will be working and working, I assure you, I will be. Um, but as I have said to some of you before, um, uh, this head still has to be able to fit in these doors. So I do thank you for all of your kind remarks. Um, it is very much appreciated, appreciated, but sincerely, the appreciation is all mine. Um, you know, as I've said, 
Um, it's the opportunities that I've had through the County of Renfrew have been just remarkable. Um, but, um, you know, as we covered in the delegation this morning, um, you know, anything that was accomplished, uh, there are 500 staff that stand around me and I only get to be the spokesperson. Um, and similarly with all of my colleagues at the County of Renfrew and not the least of which is my boss, Mr. Morrow, um, this is a team that um, inspires me to grow every day. And I learn uh, something from each one of them in the different ways that they manage and lead uh, their teams and their very effective uh, 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 departments. Um, but certainly last but not least are the elected officials. And I have to tell you, you've made my job so easy. The easiest part of my job is ever having to convince you. And it's not even the word convince. It's ever having to communicate to you why we needed to do something. And if it benefited the residents and or the staff, it was easy. And so I thank you for that because you've always had our residents at our long-term care homes uh, and our staff at the forefront of your decision-making when it came to long-term care. Um, so thank you again. And, um, you know, as I've said to my assistant, Diane, it's nose to the grindstone until the last day. So um, you haven't seen the last of me yet. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Shelley. I have absolutely no doubt that that will be the case. Uh, and I please rest assured uh, that your head is still fitting within that yellow box. So I have no concerns uh, with respect to, to, uh, uh, to your continuing on in, in the tradition that you have established over, as I had said, a quarter of a century. I think perhaps Mr. Morrow, uh, this, this might be uh, considered as, as to adjust uh, the presentation at County Council. I think this perhaps is a showstopper uh, we may wish to have this towards the end of County Council so as to not have black mm -hmm. screens through the latter parts uh, of the entire <laughs> County Council meeting. So with that uh, committee, uh, we do have uh, item number two uh, on the administration report, which is the Ontario Health Team's application update. I would invite any questions or comments. Uh, I see none. I'll provide just one. I think that, uh, as Mr. Morrow had noted, it's been an, on hiatus uh, since a year ago, precisely. Uh, today was the uh, declared, uh, the, this is the one-year anniversary of the declaration of a state of emergency in the province of Ontario. Uh, but in picking up your comments, Mr. Morrow, the uh, ad hoc, it's an incredibly long name and we haven't sat for, for some time, so I'm not entirely sure what the name of it is anymore. Um, but uh, I think that, that in leaning in, uh, certainly the, the basis by which we leaned in through long-term care, through the, uh, the uh, paramedic service, uh, definitely municipalities, and certainly this one, has a role to play within the, the provision of health care. Uh, I am certainly sensitive as well to the position that has been advocated by uh, our peer uh, municipalities, and, and in fact, AMO. Uh, in that we, we do need to tread carefully about extending ourselves further into health care, but the, the foundation of, of uh, the County of Renfrew engaging uh, in this process was that um, we are uniquely placed in that we are representative of all of the citizens right across this entire County of Renfrew, and we can bring that perspective to the table. And I recognize the, the incredible value of all of the partners uh, in health care, uh, all, all of the allied health services, uh, and that we are truly moving towards, towards a patient-centric care. And of course, this is to be led uh, by primary care as well. Uh, but there's no question that there is a role for, in our instance, certainly the County of Renfrew uh, to play a part and to be sitting on as part of the governance as we will be an integral part uh, of the delivery of healthcare. And certainly as we have been seeing uh, routinely from Chief Nolan's report, uh, community paramedicine, uh, I believe that we are also just scratching the surface of what's available to us uh, to bring health care out into the communities as opposed to make it centric uh, on an institutional basis. So I'm uh, very much encouraged. I think even the, the uh, vaccination program, the vaccine rollout across the county of Renfrew is affording perhaps the first opportunity for each of the, the uh, uh, regions, if you will, or the, the uh, catchment areas of the various acute care or hospitals. 
uh, to begin that process of, of working collaboratively towards the greater good of the whole. So um, kudos to everyone that's been involved in this. Uh, and of course, uh, as I'd said, uh, it has been on somewhat of a hiatus, uh, certainly from a, a uh, outward looking perspective. Uh, but I know that the conversations and the work has been continuing uh, in in uh, in conversations uh, since the uh, the uh, pandemic has has uh, changed our our normal. So thank you for that. With that, then, uh, can I have a motion to accept the administration report, please? Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Doncaster. Oh, sorry, I, I think Mr. Murphy, you have a question. I, yeah, I don't mind moving, um, but before we move on. Um, number one, yes, let's put health committee at the end and I'll try not to chop onions during county council. Um, but my my more important note, um, I really like uh, the reports um, referring back to the strategic plan. I found that extremely um, helpful in keeping the strat plan uh, in our brains and knowing that we're moving forward with certain initiatives. So I, I don't know who decided to change our reporting, but I really like it. And I like the one for uh, finance and admin tomorrow. So thank you to whoever did that. Uh, I'll defer, I think uh, perhaps uh, senior leadership team, but, but under the guidance of Mr. Morrow, I'm presuming, um, picking up on your comments, Councillor Murphy, I presume that this is kind of like the onboard guidance systems now that we find in our newer vehicles. Uh, it provides us that reassurance uh, that there is a roadmap that we are following, and these are the things that we are doing in following that roadmap. Perhaps, Mr. Moore, you'd like to shed a little more light on that. Sure. Thank you for that, um, Chair, and through you to committee. That was something that was identified in actually in my performance discussion with um, Council um, earlier this year and uh, some of the direction in terms of making the link. Uh, Chair, I was going to raise it under uh, new business. Um, in terms of letting uh, committee aware that the second page of the report um, from behind the agenda is the list of the strategic plan priorities. So if you wanted a more fulsome look at that list, that's page two of your report. Um, and then it is connected. And um, there will be some areas that don't fall under the strategic plan that uh, um, either uh, the director of emergency services or the director of uh, long-term care feel it's important to include, and they will continue to be included. Um, but where there is a link, we will identify those. Um, if a committee has questions or concerns about um, the look and uh, how we've approached it, by all means, let me know, and we'll see what we can do to make some tweaks. Um, but again, um, this, in terms of approach, I think uh, Rose came out with a first draft uh, for how this would look. And then um, uh, the senior leadership team took it away and uh, tweaked it a little bit. So as a group, this is what we have come up with in terms of um, um, moving forward, how we would like to present the reports and connect them to the strategic plan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Morrow. And, and as I understand it, because I know that uh, in the uh, uh, finance administration report for tomorrow morning, it is also included, I'm presuming, that this will be a standing uh, portion of, of reports, both uh, committee, standing committee and council uh, going forward from here. Uh, since it has been broached now, rather than re-engage on it uh, at new business, is there any further comment or question with respect to the uh, strategic plan uh, initiative? Well, I think we've covered that off then, uh, Mr. Morrow, so thank you for that. Chair, I oh, believe sorry. you Council of Friendly had her hand up. I I just saw that. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Yes, Councillor Frenier. Um, So the strategic plan, I would imagine, covers the partnership between the city, but I'm not seeing any reference here that it is representing the city residents as well. Um, I'll, I'll uh, the, the uh, I think, I don't know that there's a mention specifically. This is a strategic plan for the County of Renfrew, but of course it's, right. it's, the wording of it is suggestive of the population of bringing uh, these advances to the population. Uh, certainly I, I, uh, uh, it is the intent uh, of, of this particular committee. And I know also the city of Pembroke uh, has uh, representation on the community services committee as well. Uh, but certainly the, the, within the geographic county of Renfrew, all of the residents uh, can feel assured that uh, these are the goals. And on those where there is a particular representation of the city of Pembroke, 
Uh, you can give voice to that, uh, but I think even outside of those, with respect to the operations, with respect to development and property, uh, that the intent is that this is is Pan County, and of course, uh, though Pembroke is a separated city politically, it is it, it cannot escape us geographically. Uh, uh, yeah, Lord, I, is there anything you wish to add to that? I guess it's just one of my things where you know, I mean, there's been there's also been opportunities where people can apply for home improvement grants, and it's a provincial thing where the city residents can qualify, but when they read the document they don't see any indication that it includes them. So I guess it's just one of those things I always, it rises to the top for me, so. No, that's, or anything you'd like to add? Uh, nothing to add, sir, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, anything further? Uh, I will, uh, um, Ms. Shapu, uh, I did receive a mover and a seconder, I believe, on the report as a whole. I believe we need a seconder. Okay, so Councillor Murphy was the mover. Councillor Doncaster is seconding. Uh, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, is we have uh, uh, today the minutes of the Board of Health meeting, the two Board of Health meetings. Uh, one was held on Wednesday, December 9th, uh, and the other was, um, I believe, the inaugural meeting on January 8th. Uh, of this year. Uh, just as background, the January 8th meeting of this year as the inaugural meeting, the uh, board chair was elected and the board chair for 2021 uh, is Ms. Ann Akins uh, from Deep River. She has been a, a, uh, a long time member now, I think uh, perhaps since 2017 uh, of the Board of Health. Uh, certainly there are, I'm not sure if there are any county councillors now that uh, crossed paths uh, with Ms. Akins when she was the mayor of Deep River. Uh, but she also, uh, I was going to say grace to these chambers, but these chambers are kind of in the, in the uh, ether uh, right now, but certainly grace the chambers at Nine International Drive. And at that same January 8th uh, meeting, uh, Councillor Emo uh, was uh, elected as the vice chair. Uh, with respect to the uh, December 9th uh, meeting, uh, that was the uh, meeting that was held. Uh, wherein the resolution was brought forward uh, with a recommendation on providing the obligated municipalities, that is the City of Pembroke, Township of South Algonquin, and County of Renfrew, uh, with the funding requirement for the ensuing year. Uh, certainly within that uh, December 9th meeting, uh, you will see that there is a link towards the briefing note. Uh, I know that it has been uh, conversant here at, uh, at the uh, uh, county with respect to the levy requirement and the basis for and foundation for. Uh, you will find um, the, the uh, briefing note does contain background information that does shed and does illuminate uh, the basis for the funding request. So the question was whether it was COVID related. Uh, it is not. Um, I will note that in the uh, letter uh, that came forward in January to County Council, only one uh, of, uh, I believe, five pages were included, which was singularly uh, the funding request uh, of the municipalities, but there were three or four pages prior to that uh, that did illuminate uh, what the basis of that funding request. So I would certainly encourage uh, all to make sure uh, to, to click on that, uh, that link uh, and apprise yourself uh, of the documents that were in support of the funding request. Uh, with that then, any questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Doncaster. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it was certainly, uh, I did click on that link that you just uh, referred to and, and uh, um, I would say it was certainly enlightening um, and I wish we had have had that information long before we sent a letter off back to the Renfrew County District Health Unit uh, with respect to that issue. Uh, th thank you for that. And let me also say, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Morrow, if, it's, if we are in receipt um, at the uh, February Board of Health meeting, uh, the chair of the board was directed to respond uh, to the, the uh, uh, letter that the County of Renfrew sent over the signature of the warden uh, with respect to sharing more information. Um, on within that letter, I do know that uh, that one of the discussions uh, regarding that at the Board of Health was uh, that there are some substantial opportunities to improve the line of communication between, uh, I would suggest, all of the municipal funding partners, 
uh, and the Board of Health. And I think that, that would go a long way. Uh, that We've already had a discussion today vis-a-vis uh, COVID and, and Miramichi Lodge of uh, all of the transparency that we can possibly provide, uh, I think provides a great deal of, of uh, reassurance and confidence to all parties. Uh, so as uh, Councillor Doncaster has said, in hindsight, uh, then I think that would have been most useful and perhaps on a going forward basis, uh, it would be a much more pragmatic uh, if that were part of the package that the municipal funding partners were to receive. Thank you. Anything further on the minutes of the Board of Health? Um, do we accept those, uh, Mr. Morrow? I'm... Um, Chair, I do believe you get a typically get a mover and a second to receive those. Uh... To receive them. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I have a mover to receive the minutes of the Board of Health meetings of December 9th, 2020 and January 8th, 2021? Councillor Lafreniere has so moved. Councillor Doncaster is seconding. Any further question or comment? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Uh, just bear with me as I return to. Uh, so, as I had said, uh, new business, Mr. Morrow, that you were bringing forward vis a vis the standing uh, page two of our uh, strategic plan uh, and connecting uh, the various committee reports to it. Uh, I think we've uh, we've accomplished that. Is there any further new business? Councillor Doncaster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just like to uh, uh, shout out, make a shout out to uh, the partnership between the Deep River and District Hospital and the North Renfrew Long-Term Care Centre uh, and led by the Renfrew County District Health Unit with respect to uh, the vaccine rollout. And, uh, and I'll move back to the, the first uh, vaccine clinic that they held, uh, the first one that they held in, in that area, um, as I said, led by the health unit, um, where they vaccinated uh, seamlessly uh, hundreds of people in a, single, in a single day. There's been a number of clinics since that. Um, they have worked uh, very well, very smoothly, very streamlined. I would also say that um, the registration system that was set up. Um, when, I, when I first saw that link, I forwarded it to my 86-year-old mother. My 86-year-old mother uses an iPad and uses a computer, but you know, not, not really well. She was able to go on and register on a Thursday, had an email either later that night or the next morning, was able to book an appointment for the following Tuesday to get her vaccine. And if she can do it online, I will, I will put out there that almost anybody could do it online. So, so it must have been a, a, a very uh, easy process to do. Um, now that's uh, obviously that's, that's if you have an email address and if you're online, um, but outside of that, the health unit has set up the uh, a telephone number that you can deal with. So uh, I just, thanks to the, uh, to the partnership that they've, um, rolled out certainly in this area and to the leadership of the Renfrew County District Health Unit on, uh, you know, the vaccine rollout so far. We know that there's challenges with, with supply, but uh, it's, it's starting to roll and it's very encouraging. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Councillor Doncaster. And I appreciate you actually bringing that forward. I think that uh, um, all of us uh, here um, in, in, uh, as leaders in the municipal realm, uh, it's incumbent upon us to continue to provide that information to our communities, to reassure our communities. Uh, there is, is uh, great discussion uh, at all times, as Chief Nolan has said earlier in the meeting today, about uh, constructing the airplane as we are flying. Uh, and that has been certainly the case for a full uh, 12 months now, um, that I think it is incumbent upon us to continue to reassure our population um, uh, I myself will, will put forward that, that uh, I have uh, faith in our uh, science and in our medical community and whatever particular vaccine by whatever particular manufacturer that has been approved by the country of Canada uh, that is in the syringe as it's about to go into my arm will probably be the first time I've ever been picked with a needle uh, that it has actually brought me joy. So I will certainly extend that that, that is the, the escape hatch 
uh, from this surreal world that we inha have inhabited for 12 months. So thank you for that, Councillor Doncaster. Any further new business? Uh, just the final, uh, and, and certainly that was a segue to that, um, uh, Councillor Doncaster. I just wanted to mention that, of course, uh, St. Patrick's is, of course, a, a milestone uh, here in the Ottawa Valley, and particularly in, in my community, and is that which we often uh, will tie other events to or have memories of, oh, that was at St. Patrick's or a week after St. Patrick's, et cetera. So it is certainly a time for celebration, but as I had indicated, it is now also become the anniversary of the declaration of a state of emergency uh, in the province of Ontario. And I think it's, it's, it, it bears uh, stating uh, just some of these things, the impact that it has had, and certainly um, Ms. Sheedy had made uh, reference to this. Uh, so we now have had four deaths in, in the area served by Renfrew County and District Health Unit. We've had seven, uh, just under 7,200 deaths uh, in the province of Ontario. We've had uh, closing up on 23,000 uh, in Canada, and we are now at just under 2.7 million across the globe. Uh, this in my lifetime has been the first uh, issue that has a global impact. Uh, certainly generations prior to this have had, uh, but I think it is incumbent upon us uh, to, to perhaps take a moment today uh, that uh, to reflect on the impact that this has had, uh, take comfort in the astonishing uh, response of the scientific community, the, the, uh, the developers, the pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical companies that have so rapidly advanced a vaccine that is going to be our, our way out of this. Um, but at the same time, uh, recognize the enormity uh, of what COVID has wrought on the globe uh, and to not lose sight of that. So uh, that's my only bit of new business for today. Uh, with that, then, if there's nothing further, uh, is there any requirement, Mr. Morrow, for a closed meeting? No, sir, there is not. Thank you. Uh, the date of the next meeting then shall be Wednesday, April 14th, 2021, and I would seek a motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Doncaster, seconded by uh, Councillor Murphy, all in favour. Thank you, and we were all in under, under noon.